John 20, 1 to 23. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then, following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple, who'd reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she was crying, she stooped down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. When it was evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to spend some time looking at John chapter 20. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into it together. Dear Lord, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, we've had a busy morning and uh, we come together now as people who've had very different days and weeks uh, have been made differently by you. But we share one truth in common. Gathered together today, this is a witness that we understand that the events around the empty tomb are worth remembering. Father, remind us of the truth that that provides, that in Jesus Christ alone, this world can have peace. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, let me be very clear with you because I like to kick off in a clear way. This world has always had a problem with conflict. Now, there are many solutions and many uh, articles that are written about the cause of that. I prefer the simple one. Uh, it's really because we all think we're God. And as I've said a number of times, when you fill a world with seven billion gods, there's bound to be a fight, isn't there? Now, that's the deep cause of the conflict. But the conflicts that we're mostly familiar with are the ones that dominate our newspaper headlines, the grand ones, the world wars, the massive geopolitical standoffs, right through to civil wars, protests. Well, let's be blunt again. Conflict is the state of our world, always has been. I visited one website this week. This website aims to track conflict in the world. This website said, under an estimate, that today... There are more than 40 significant conflicts currently in the world today. There's three major wars, 
12 minor wars, 24 minor skirmishes and conflicts, and the rest are arguments. I I don't know what the difference is between a major or a minor war. They're all significant. And they haven't even counted the one that has cost them most lives, which is the war on drugs in Mexico, which in the last 12 months has led to 50,000 deaths. That's not even getting to what we experienced last week, is it? In our own homes, in our own communities, in our own workplaces. Isolation, crosswords, injury, perhaps even violence. When you wrap all that up and put it in front of someone, it really shows how we've gone at making peace in the world as humans, doesn't it? Just thinking on a global scale, there have been two significant attempts over the last few decades. The first was at the end of the First World War. It was called the League of Nations. Most people have never even heard of it because that's how significant it was. After the Second World War, the United Nations was formed. And if you wanted to assess the United Nations, it's struggling valiantly, isn't it? Under the banner of the United Nations, under their peacekeeping forces, since the end of the Second World War, there have been 57 completed peace missions. And when you hold that up against the statistics I just read, wow, there's not much hope, is there? At the moment, there are 13 current missions. And the annual budget for the United Nations for peacekeeping, $6.58 billion, about double, just double what South Africa spends on its army every year. Pretty much on a global scale, our efforts at peacekeeping have been spectacularly unsuccessful, haven't they? Spectacularly unsuccessful. And that's even when we set the bar for peace very low. Think about the peace we like in the world, the one that ticks the box. Basically, it's just non-violence. We can persuade people to put away their guns. And let me tell you, on the Korean Peninsula, that's going really well at the moment, isn't it? It doesn't even dive into the level of personal conflict we experience. And that's dominated the media over the last month, hasn't it? The conflict that rages in our communities, families, even our parliament, which rears its ugly head and damages all those around it. We're a world dominated by cross words and the conflict they bring. Everywhere people are, there is a deep desire for peace, but none of us can make it. I mean, the reason we're gathered here today is because of the events of a conflict. Isn't that right? The events of a conflict and a murder. The first Easter, especially Good Friday, was established in a conflict. Just think about the events surrounding that moment. Oh, on the immediate level, it was a conflict between one man and the religious authorities of his own people. It was connected to a wider geopolitical conflict at the Roman occupation of Israel. And then it drew in personal conflict because one of his closest mates betrayed him for some silver. The death of Jesus covers every level of conflict we experience personally, doesn't it? And that's not even delving deeper, as we heard on Friday, into the grand scale, which is the conflict between Bernard and God, the conflict between you and God. That's the conflict that led Jesus to the cross, to his death, the conflict that began way back there in the third chapter of the Bible, where humans said to God, we can do better without you. Now, we've talked about what that is, haven't we? We just saw it in the kids' talk. It's called sin, isn't it? As I say in Scripture, it's the attitude and action that has I in the middle that says I'm God and God's not. Separates me from God, as we heard on Friday. Puts me at war with God, as we've heard time and time again. It's an attitude and action that God responds to with great fairness, as he said. If you don't want life with me, that's okay but you swap the author of life for yourself as God. And what do you get? You get death. And the death of Jesus was actually the climax of God's promise 
to deal with that. As Jesus died, he stood in for humans. As Jesus died, he stood in for the judgment we deserve for rebelling against God. As Jesus died, as we heard on Friday, he removed the obstacle between me and God so I could know God and be returned to life. Today we gather to remember where it finished, at the resurrection. Now on one level, and there was a really interesting survey on the ABC this morning about people's beliefs about the resurrection. On one level, there's a lot of debate about the historicity of the resurrection. Did it actually happen? Let me be very clear about where I stand. It happened. It took place. It's a real event. In fact, when you sit down and examine the facts, and you'll breathe a sigh of relief, we can't do all of that now, but when you examine the facts, it's the most plausible, reasonable and logical explanation of an empty tomb. Those women that were mentioned, they knew where he was buried. They didn't go to the wrong tomb because it was dark. The Romans, they know how to deal out death. So he really was dead, not just unconscious. And it was all done in public so that Mary's accusation, they've done a swifty and moved the body, that couldn't have happened. It was fully transparent. The resurrection happened. But it then raises questions for us. If it happened, what does it prove? Something so significant. It proves a number of things. It certainly says that Jesus did the job he came to do when he said, it is finished on the cross, those cross words we thought about on Friday. All the judgment for sin for God's people had been spent on him. It was a public display that God and Jesus are the most significant things in the universe. That's what the word glory means when we heard it from the reading from John 13. It was certainly a statement that God kept his word that he dealt with the root cause of all of that brokenness. So that's what it proves. Perhaps the even deeper question is, what does it provide? What does it provide? And I think the words of Jesus, the first words of Jesus to his close community are helpful. The suffering is there, the, the backdrop of his suffering And did you notice there in that reading that we had from John chapter 20 that they're also in fear? Did you notice that? They were gathered together, verse 19, John 20, with the doors locked because of their fear. Against the backdrop of his conflict and their fear, what does Jesus say? Then Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. He doesn't just say it once, does he? Look down there in verse 21. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. And then later on in the week when he catches up with Thomas, down there in verse 26, Jesus says it again, peace to you. Our first and our last words are the bookends of our lives, aren't they? Isn't that the case? What did you say this week as a baby? The first word, the last word. Well, that's what we've done over Easter as we've looked at Jesus' last and first words. They're worth paying attention to. Now, you could dismiss Jesus' words here as, well, his way of saying, hey, g'day, guys, I'm still here. I think that would be to reduce them. He's certainly at least greeting them. But I think he's actually saying, if you pay attention, this is what you need. The most significant thing any human needs. John chapter 16, verse 33, look at it later on. He greets his mob with this word, peace to you. He then shows them the evidence. Did you notice that in verse 20? He shows them his hands and his side and they rejoice because it actually is true. This bloke is standing amongst us. And then do you notice what he says? Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me. I also send you. You see, it's not meant to stay behind locked doors, this thing, this peace. See, that's what he's telling them to take to the world. Did you notice that there? Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. They're to take peace to the world and not the peace that means you put down a gun and store away the bullets. It's something bigger than our world has ever experienced. Listen to how he describes it in John 14, verse 27, at that same meal, that was his last meal. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. 
Your heart must not be troubled or fearful. You see, when we settle for peace as the world defines it, which is no conflict and no one firing a gun, our hearts are still troubled, aren't they? There are still sleepless nights. There's still fear. And Jesus says, I'm not giving you that peace. I'm actually going to deal out peace. They won't just put the gun away. It will still your heart. I'm going to give to you a peace that won't just put the bullets away. It will remove anxiety from the core of your being because do you notice what Jesus is dealing with? He's not dealing with your flesh solely. He's dealing with your flesh and the heart inside. He's dealing with the essence of you as a human, which means, as we heard on Friday, that he deals with sin. He restores humans to God. This piece is about dealing with God first because we bear his image, we rejected him, he judges us, and he commits to dealing with it for us. That's the heart of peace at last, that vertical relationship between Bernard and God, between you and God. It deals with who you are as a human. It deals with your heart. It deals with the thing that robs you of rest and swaps it with anxiety. Put simply, it means that we can understand who we really are. I am not God and God is. Which means that we have a fundamentally different way of relating to each other. You see, you're not a competitor. You're not another God in the universe that wants to take what's mine. Instead, it means that we can look at each other as broken image bearers of God and deal peacefully with each other. And Jesus helps us see how that is possible. Did you pick that up in the readings that we had? The first is there in in John chapter 20. Listen again to John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What does this peace look like? It's very simple. Just as the Father sent Jesus to go and forgive, So Jesus sends his mob to go and forgive. It's no different to the way God's dealt with us. Go and forgive. Now don't hear me wrongly. It's not saying that if you are a minister or a serious Christian or you've got some title before your name because you work for a church, you can just wander around handing out blank checks for forgiveness. Do you notice the connection there? As the Father has sent me, I also send you. They go with a message. Have you met Jesus? It's in his name that forgiveness is achieved. It's his name that goes out into the world to be proclaimed and practised. And the first place, and this is the second part of what it looks like, the first place it's practised is where? Well, that was a reading from John 13. Did you pick that up? The first place it's practised is amongst God's mob. I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. It's displayed first and foremost amongst the people of God. And when you think about it, that's the kind of love that should characterise us. It's a love that gives preciously. Remember John 3.16? It's a love that goes where it knows it will be rejected. John chapter 10, 1 verse 10. It's a love that looks its enemy in the eye and says, I sacrifice for you. John 15. It's a love that doesn't sit still, but it seeks those who are broken, John 10, 16. That's the type of love that offers forgiveness, a 
passing over of sins, the wiping away of sins to those who don't deserve it, those who don't seek it, those who don't even know they need it and it's to be taken to the world. Over this Easter, we spent a lot of time looking at crosswords. In fact, the view of our world is that blokes like me bring too many crosswords and it causes too much conflict. Many in our world would say that the things that we talk about here are the crosswords that have caused so much violence in the world. But let me tell you, that's wrong. The crosswords connected with the death and resurrection of Jesus are exactly the words our world needs to hear, proclaimed and practised. From Friday, it's finished. From Easter Sunday, peace be to you. We've got those words. We've seen those words proven by the resurrection of Jesus. We've experienced those words. We've been restored by those words. We're commanded to display those words. So let me finish with three very simple questions. Have you heard those crosswords? Are you living those crosswords? Are you taking those crosswords? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thanks for the crosswords of your son, the words uttered in those moments around the cross. As he breathes his last, it is finished. As he meets his disciples and says, peace be to you. Father, these are the words that restore. They don't divide. These are the words that reconcile. They don't split. These are the words that forgive and don't hold on. Father, please help us to know those words. Please help us to live those words. Please help us to take those words to a world that is so damaged by conflict. In Jesus' name, amen.